Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for your kind words of introduction. Hey, uh, I also would like to thank um, Dr. Bansi for the kind invite and, uh, and a good topic, which we probably don't discuss on every day, meet on diabetes or in uh, or uh, non-communicable diseases as such. But then very pertinent to know the basic science between why we need to do exercise. And what is that more intriguing in this uh, I mean, the topic is, would be the timing of exercise. It's just that exercise is enough. First of all, we do have problems with exercise and now we are also going, digging deep into it. Does the time make any difference? So let's see what uh, I have in the next 10 to 12 minutes to present to you so that we can make this um, uh, symposium on lifestyle modification much more interesting. So the agenda is very simple. In the next 12 minutes, I'll be talking about the muscle maladaptation to hyperglycemia. Then to talk about, uh, I mean, just a brief uh, touch on the circadian rhythm as well as the exercise. And last, uh, most important would be the therapeutic potential uh, for the timing of exercise. If you look at the different kinds of exercise, as we know, we do have this low intensity exercise, which we call the endurance exercise, which we do for jogging or uh, uh, slow running, even marathon can be qualified as an endurance exercise. And we also have high intensity exercise where we do uh, like something like speed intervals that you do a sprint of 100 meters dash, 400 meters dash, everything that we just saw in Olympics. So they come and they come under the high intensity exercise. And also we do have the resistant kind of exercise, which are isometric exercise where you we use deadlift, we use weights lift and they come under the resistant type of exercise and we also have the other exercise for stretching flexibility that is yoga so these are the different kind of exercises that we uh, would rather have every type 2 diabetic patient and type 1 diabetic patient also go through so giving a right prescription for exercise itself is a quite challenging and a symposium on itself now coming to the topic uh, we also should know that there are different fibers that subserve this function so the type 2 fibers, uh, which are uh, also called as a fast twitch, they are more glycolytic and they are easy fatigable so that they work only for a shorter period of time. That's why you have this uh, the person like um, for who goes for a 100 meter uh, dash. He, if you ask him to keep going, but he slowly the muscles get fatigued because they are all glycolytic because he has been trained for that kind of way because he has recruited type 2 fibers more. But for a person who is lean, who is a marathoner, uh, like uh, uh, Kipchoge, uh, which you know that uh, who is having the timing as a fastest marathoner in this world, he has probably a type 1 fibers, which are the slow twitch fibers, which are, they, they work only during the aerobic condition, that is, they are highly, they are in an oxidative state of, um, uh, state of, uh, I mean, when they are in the oxidative state. So, it all depends on what kind of recruitment during the training process. And all this uh, will definitely uh, have an impact on the gene expression as well. So what are the uh, various adaptations to different training types? So if you are being trained for a particular kind of exercise, for example, aerobic exercise, what would be the objective for doing an aerobic exercise is that it probably is to enhance your cardiovascular function. We call it cardiorespiratory fitness point of view. It also promotes skeletal muscle mitochondrial biogenesis, so more mitochondria chondria will be synthesized and thus is improve your endurance. When you talk about resistance training, what they do is that they produce, you know, the body sculpting that we call that is skeletal muscle hypertrophy and it increases the power or the strength. So you have um, more powerful contractions fueled by glycolysis and they are supported by high lactate threshold that we call it that higher lactate dehydrogenase content. But said that, which is superior to the other. If you look, there is they both contribute to the wellness, both increase the insulin sen sensitivity because they increase the group 4 expression, increase the glycogen synthase, increase the glycogen stores. So hence, you have a better glycemic control. So when you combine these two types of uh, training, this definitely imparts a good metabolic health. But what happens in patients with diabetes or when the patient has uh, been in a state of chronic hyperglycemia. So if you look into this particular slide, this is very probably a little difficult to understand, but I'll go through it. 
in chronic hyperglycemia, there is skeletal extracellular matrix accumulation, including increased total of the extracellular matrix area, and you have the glycation and the collagen content they are more. What this can do is that this can lead on to increased mechanical stress during muscle contraction, and there is an hyperactivation of those pathway, the signaling pathways, which are called MKK4 and the JNK signaling axis. And there's the downstream targets, that is the P7, 4, uh, S6K, as well as the SMAT2. So what they do is that they increase the, the glycolytic signaling. So they increase the uh, type 2 fibers, which are um, used for isometric exercise or the resistance training. So when you are going to uh, have a more of a glycolytic fiber, there is less number of oxidative fiber and more of glycolytic fiber. So when it, then what happens is that this is actually hyperglycemic state. What happens is that it blunts the aerobic exercise. Why do we want to do aerobic exercise? Because we want to increase the, uh, what you call the oxidative fiber. So because you are going to induce a more and more of blood capillaries. So the, what it actually leads is that by doing an aerobic exercise, there is an increased capillary density and there is an oxidative type, that is a type 1 uh, fibers are uh, recruited more. So what they do is that they increase the aerobic exercise capacity. Unfortunately, in patients with hyperglycemia, this process is blunted. They have more of glycolytic fiber, less of oxidative fiber, and this will definitely lead on to no exercise capacity. So a patient who is already diabetic for long period of time, doesn't take care of his uh, lifestyle. If he has been asked to do exercise by the doctor, primary care physician, he feels fatigued quite quickly. And then after a few, uh, probably a week or two, he says that I can't take it anymore. I'm not able to even uh, take a jog for more than 400 meters or for half a kilometer. He starts panting for breath because you have the glycolytic fiber more. So glycolysis goes up, the lactic uh, uh, goes up very much and they can produce muscle cramps and more of a muscle injury. This is the maladaptation that happens during state of chronic hyperglycemia. So the hyperglycemia definitely blunts the aerobic ex uh, exercise capacity. As we know that high aerobic exercise capacity is increased with increased longevity. We are talking about the telomere, uh, length of the telomere. So this is very good for every person, every individual, whether he is diabetic or not. We already are in a milieu of uh, bad metabolic, uh, uh, what do you call the existence, whether call it uh, the diet that you take, call it the quality of sleep that we all having as of now, or the kind of stress that is work related or job, I'm sorry, or finance related. So we are all in a very bad, um, what we we'll say, uh, a condition, all of us. So only a way that we can that can change probably one of the methods would be having to undergo a regular aerobic exercise. But people with impaired glucose metabolism, just I have alluded to you, they have a more of a resistant training or resistance or a strength training kind of uh, what you call the recruitment of muscle fibers. This leads on to a blunted response to exercise training. Even though they exercise, they, as long as they are in a state of hyperglycemia, their maladaptation of the skeletal muscle fibers keep continuing. So they don't see the change. And now let's see what about the next part of the talk. What is the timing of uh, uh, the exercise? The mammalian cells possess an internal molecular clock um, that consists of the transcription or the translational autoregulatory feedback loops. Physical activity modulates the molecular clock in skeletal muscle affecting both the amplitude as well as the phase of the circadian rhythms. So exercise potentially remodels the mitochondrial morphology and dynamics. As we said that endurance exercise increases mitochondrial biogenesis both in a short period of time as well as in the longer period of time. Therefore, timing the exercise bouts to coincide with the mitochondrial dynamic period might increase the acute effects of exercise in a terms of uptake uh, and utilization which is going to be of our and towards the advantage. So let us see what exercise is good and at what time. So you do have the time as a very important uh, factor to consider. So resistance exercise, when you are going to the, the gym for doing weight lifting, daytime peak forces nearly always demonstrate as being highest in the afternoon and as well as the evening. So 
So when you look at the exercise, uh, if you are going to hit the gym and you are going to do weight lifts, probably the time would be between 4 and 8 o'clock, not at 6 to 10 a.m. So, so if you are going to do for going to hit, probably if you can change your timing from morning to evening, you see a better, what you call, recruitment of fibers. So not that it is bad, but just that you are trying to sync with the circadian rhythm. So the high intensity exercise, again, you are using a treadmill for a uh, very high, I mean, very uh, good speed workout in a gym, or you are going to hit the road for speed intervals. Again, afternoon and evening would be the best timing, not in the morning. But when it comes to endurance exercise, I think it is equivocal. It is okay that you go for a 10K run or a 20 kilometer run or a or 20 miler run. Uh, that is uh, 32 kilometers. It is equivocal. You can do it in the daytime or in the evening, no issues at all. So when you're talking about a moderate or endurance exercise, you don't have any kind of a circadian rhythm pattern that you need to follow. But definitely high intensity and resistance exercise, you do have a time interval where these do respond much towards the maximum benefit. So exercise physiology, you know, what it tells us based upon all these um, animal studies and as well as in human studies is that you have increased strength, power and endurance often is observed more in towards the afternoon and evening compared with early morning. So disruptions of the diurnal rhythm definitely negatively affect the athlete's performance. It need not be athlete. Any person who is indulging in, we call ourselves as probably uh, recreational runners. So we do it for a kind of recreation with fitness in mind as a probably a primary objective. So, but if an athlete, a trained elite runner who is going to represent his country in an international level, very important that they have to travel much early to reach the spot where then event is being held. So when you are moving towards the east, so eastward trans travel has a greater negative effect just because of the, because of the, so we go through the different time zones. So our circadian rhythm gets upset and that can lead on to intermittent uh, negative uh, sprint performance and the, the, the psychological indicators are fatigue are much more than when you are going towards the west. So from India, if you are going towards Tokyo for the Java, for the Olympics that just concluded, I think from India we had we need to go much earlier than a person who is traveling from the west to east. So the eastward migratory people they have to be very careful. Westward because we are still as most of you have traveled from India to US. The morning, early morning you travel, but still in the daytime you reach the US. Uh, uh, homeland the same day. So the, the circadian rhythm does not get as bad as a person who moves towards, uh, who travels eastwards. So if you look at this particular uh, uh, dif uh, difficult uh, cartoon on the skeletal muscle and the circadian biology, what you could see is the on the green, the mitochondrial function, you can see that works maximum, the green maximum, it works between 4 o'clock to 11 o'clock. That's it. So if you're looking at resistance and power exercise, again, you can see it is from say around four o'clock to 10 o'clock. And if you're looking at a cycling performance, the red, you can see that all these activities, they uh, loom around afternoon or evening or towards the night time. So better that when you are doing training of exercise and if you have a coach who is trained in all these um, fitness regimes, I think they will advise you for sure that these kind of exercise, if Timed well, along with the exercise, they are also timed well. Then you can, uh, uh, what do you call, reap more benefits. So the therapeutic potential of timing of exercise is very important. As we know that both type 2 diabetes and obesity are associated with loss of good quality of sleep, all of us. And especially during the last 20 months, where people are studying from home, work from home, and with um, no other uh, recreation. So we are all glued to Netflix and other OTT uh, panels, you know that our sleep pattern is totally in chaos. So you, that's the reason that obesity and type 2 diabetes uh, definitely uh, will be more just because we have disrupted this uh, core clock machinery. As exercise is known to reset the clock genes in the skeletal muscle and other tissues, it could be probably hypothesized that appropriately and recurrently timed exercise. So timing of exercise and repeated exercise definitely can help to reset the daily clock and improve pathologically the deteriorating circadian rhythms. 
So improving these dysregulated diet daily rhythms might help to ameliorate the uh, narrative, uh, sorry, the negative metabolic consequences. So whatever the uh, what we call the uh, muscle fibers that we have talked about, the type two fibers or the type one fibers, they can be recruited as per the need, and that will help in probably negating the uh, bad metabolic health because of the uh, dysregulation of the circadian rhythm. And this one very, uh, what do you call that, uh, kind of uh, uh, experimental model, which had been done by Savik and all, which was published in Diabetology very recently, has shown that afternoon uh, doing the high intensity interval, that is the speed, I mean, the kind of high intensity where your VO2 max goes up to 80% or more, they have found that it is much more efficacious than doing the morning. So when you are doing this kind of high intensity work, they, they are much more efficacious when you do it in the morning. Another reason they have found is that if you are going to do it in the morning, they found that there is a patient who are having diabetes, they have much more elevated glucose despite the insulin sensitivity improving. Acutely, you have a surge in the blood glucose during the time of the exercise compared with the pre-training period, a pre-training period or the afternoon. So patients with diabetes, if they undergo a morning a high intensity uh, training protocol or regimen, their blood glucose goes up. So we have to be very careful. So when you are giving a good exercise prescription, I think these are all should be in your mind. When you talk about for a normal obese person, or when I'm talking about a normal glycemic obese person as well as a dysglycemic obese person. So aligning exercise bouts with the systemic circadian rhythm appears to confer a differential glycate response in people with diabetes. So if you could see in this cartoon, those who have undergone morning uh, exercise, which are depicted in orange or red, they have much more higher glucose excursions than those who are in the in the, the shaded blue or blue, you can see that they have a glucose response is, I mean, the glucose surge is much lower throughout the period of day uh, because they have used the continuous glucose monitoring, be it in the training week one or you have the training week two. So as the training goes on, even if the sugars have come down in general, in general, but still you see that <coughs> patients with type 2 diabetes definitely have a much more a uh, greater surge during the course of the day compared with people who have been exercising in the late evening. Along with that, nutrition is very important. So unless until you don't have a mindful eating and nutritional offload, these exercises per se may not help because all to, to be fair and square, so if you want to keep a good metabolic health, 70% is going to be diet and 30% is going to be exercise. So by performing, uh, when you are having a periodized nutritional protocols, I think there is, I mean, that means itself in another symposium when you're talking about giving a intense workout in the evening with a subsequent low carbohydrate diet, this uh, resulting in a low carbon availability for, in the, in the, for, for the muscle and the liver glycogen and followed by a good quality of sleep. This has demonstrated a lot of benefits in exercise performance and the skeletal muscle signaling response of the lipid oxidation path. So this is very important. So this is called load training protocol. So low in the sense that we are talking about low carbohydrate. So when you are giving a training protocol with a low carbohydrate rate, as soon as because there's always a tendency that after good exercise, we say that, okay, uh, in a carbohydrate in is equal to carbohydrate out. So whatever I have spent in the morning in the gym, uh, let me go out or let me order from a uh, Swiggy or Zomato, let me have a biryani, which can, uh, which I can, I need not be guilty enough to eat. But that concept is totally, probably wrong. So when you are going to have a good exercise regime, followed by a low carb diet, this will definitely help in resetting the circadian rhythms in a much better way, as well as both the skeletal, as well as the lipid oxidation pathway are taken care of. I think I have, uh, my time stops there. So, the take-home message would be uh, skeletal muscles have an uh, extensive network of clock uh, control genes and the dysregulation of its molecular clock can lead on to deleterious metabolic consequence. Physical strength and skeletal muscle mitochondrial function peak in the late afternoon, whereas the low energy sensitive signals peak in the morning. 
Excess cells can reset the molecular circadian clock, thereby effectively ameliorating the negative effects of disrupted sleep patterns. Optimizing the timings of exercise bouts could aid existing the therapeutic interventions for the management of metabolic disease and divergent modalities of exercise. Whether it is resistance or high intensity training or endurance type of exercise can interact with the circadian rhythm, resulting in potent metabolic effects. Thank you for your patient learning.